for me, the Clash were the most dangerous, aggressive, inventive group um, that I think I've ever seen, and they remain so to this day. The punk movement was that black and white, edgy negative to the psychedelia of peace and love hippie movement. It wasn't just blind rage. There was thought and intellect behind this performance and these lyrics. With the Clash works in a very, very fast way. A lot of those songs would be written in half an hour, lyrics and music. It was the attitude, the conviction with which they were playing. That's the punk aspect of it, the do-it-yourself ethos. The, you know, get on your feet and do it. Stand up for yourself, do it. It was, it, you know, it was very forceful. It was changing society and that, that whole kind of that whole vibration was in the air. They were a breath of fresh air in a very stagnant period. I knew what punk rock was. The moment it came along, it was made for me. I wanted that. I was a punk rocker up north, bored, bored, bored by uh, crappy hippie bands. And all I was listening to was reggae and soul music and feeling very isolated. And it was punk that made me realise there were people like me in every town around and loads of them in London. Mick Jones told me that uh, when they first started playing, they weren't even they'd even thinking about getting a record contract. I mean, it was just out, out of the question. They just wanted, as three former art students would feel, they wanted to look fantastic on stage. That was the first thing they wanted to be. Would you like to interview our manager while he's here? Catch him while he's yeah, hot. Burning. Bernie? Bernie? Bernie. Oh, leave him, leave him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's Bernie Rose. Sorry about that. Come back. He invented punk. Bernie was the most extraordinary man that's ever managed a, a rock band. It's obviously too much for him. Bernie, you know, had a 10-year jump on the guys. He was, you know, 10 years older. But he was very in tune with kind of the counter-cultural movements and the legacy of counter-cultural movements. You know, he would have known about the Paris riots in 68 or Kent State or the Groves and Square riots. And, um, you know, he was the one that, you know, told the clash, you know, you've got to write about what you know about, what you understand. I don't know if you can ever please Bernie, because Bernie, his dream was to have a very, very uh, a band that was about anarchy, about power, about anti-establishment and you can only be so you can only go so far down that road because you'll be in prison so he liked the idea of the chaos of it all and he was only happy when it was chaos and he hated it when everything went smoothly funny enough so he was in a, in a position where you can't ever be happy really what Rhodes I think contributed uh, was um, the ideas that he would got from 1968 and the whole Paris revolution in 19 or the Paris the student uprising in 1968 in Paris which was ideas like situationism certain certain um, kind of a sort of trendy vision of Marxism. He had a fair point in, in the early days. I think he actually brought them together. He was a bit of a Malcolm McLaren, you know. Um, they had definitely had a, a very good relationship, you know, albeit complicated. And uh, I don't quite know what the relationship was between Mick and Bernie and Joe and Bernie and Joe and Mick. And, you know, it was this sort of triangle. When I met, um, it, as it was then, it was um, the, the first band was London SS. Uh, Mick, Mick was there and Bernard was putting that together. There was a very different attitude, an attitude of this is going to happen. One way or another, we are going to get there. And I like that because that's the way I felt. But no one else I've met in the whole of London had anything like that attitude. So that was something very interesting to me. Although they were quite challenging. You had a lot of trouble in Germany. Yeah, it's fucking horrible. I never want to come back here again. It stinks. My brothers are fucking slammer. They ain't got a fucking hotel for us. The gigs are fucking useless. We ain't got. Mick Jones, uh, kind of, it's a little less different place around London. He's he's brought up by his uh, gran. And um, he's, he's a total music head, like from the age of 11 he was going to gigs. His childhood dream was to be a rock star. Um, you know, he had worked hard at his music, he had been in band after band after band. And he was a big fan of people like Mott the Hoople and The Faces, those kind of people's bands um, that British kids liked in the early 70s. We got to know Mott the Hoople really well. Mick and all his mates, they used to follow up and down the country, jump in the trains, get the trains to free, turn up the gigs, blagging their way in, hang out backstage. And that's how he learned about rock and roll, because Mott the Hoople was very good to the fans looks after the fans and let them stay in the hotel, which is very much part of the Clash kind of myth. There just has to be new groups and then that's what you got. I think Mick's influence was there already. He had a very, Mick's always been good at uh, picking the right tunes and somehow he's a very musical type of person. He, 
he knows what's going to work. And the set as they had it there, or the collection of songs, together worked quite well. I thought this was a band I wouldn't mind going to see. The band that Bernie had kind of got together or, or kind of facilitated with Mick and Tony, uh, they had rehearsals um, underneath a cafe uh, in, uh, well, opposite Paddington Station. And um, Paul Simonon turned up, not as a potential uh, musician, but he was, uh, he was just there with his mate, he was trying out on the drums. What Paul Simonon really was, was the guy that the Clash were actually singing about. Um, without him, they, they may have been a bit of a fake, but, but Paul Simonon was the real thing. The school I went to, right? I mean, they sort of like, all the kids are supposed to sort of like be factory project, you know, that sort of stuff. And like, the school's sort of built, it's a real sort of depressing school and that. And you go there, you don't learn nothing. All you're sort of like working for is just to go into the factory which is around the corner, or something like that. And, uh, well, most of the mates I know are all working in the factory. Are there a lot of your fans on the doll? I mean, do they feel the same way? Yeah, obviously they wouldn't come to my gig, would they? Bernie kind of recognised, and Mick to a certain extent, they kind of realised that even though Paul wasn't a musician, he just looked exactly the part of um, somebody you'd want to have in your band, and they realised he had a kind of particular kind of cool and a particular attitude anyway. <laughs> I came back to uh, the second incarnation, which was the beginnings of The Clash, um, and then it was uh, Mick uh, and Paul and another singer called Billy Watts and Keith Levine. Uh, and that line-up, we rehearsed a bit, did a few things. Um, it had progressed. It was a bit stronger, a bit more focused, a bit more clear, but they got a little bit more... Um, fixated on the attitude they needed for success, so there was a there was a bit of austerity there. That was uh, they they got a bit less cheerful and more focused, I suppose. Mm. Um, and then uh, I came back another time, a few weeks later, to have another look at this. And uh, I walked in, and they said the singer's gone, i.e., Billy had gone, which surprised me at the time. And and this is the new singer, and it was Joe. And Joe was uh, an unlikely looking character. He didn't look like um, the way you expect a rock band singer to look like at all, quite the reverse. And he didn't, he was ne Joe was never one for niceties or um, never one for pleasantries in conversation. So he just kind of grunted at me and I thought, and his voice was kind of always got kind of funny growly quality. So I thought, he's a peculiar sort of singer, but I thought, well, fair enough. They obviously has something that he appreciate. Much later on, of course, I, I understood all sorts of other things about Joe, other qualities he had. But at the time, it was very odd meeting him. If they weren't on the doll, would they be your fans? Well, I mean, if there was jobs, then they wouldn't be on the doll. Maybe we'd be singing about love and kissing or something. Joe was on the scene because he was playing with the, the 101ers, and <laughs> Mick and Tony James had kind of been to check them out previously. And they kind of recognise in Joe like this sort of really brilliant frontman. Now, there's an apocryphal story about how he met Jones and Simonon, which is apparently that um, he was standing in a dole queue and they were looking at him and he was looking at them and he thought he was going to get beaten up by them and then he thought he, that he was going to have to beat them up or some such nonsense. It was a very sort of punk rock, violent thing again. Um, and... Uh, that, I think, there's probably some truth to that, that they met in a doll queue, although it, it also suits the whole, that whole kind of revolutionary chic that The Clash had. Yes, he came from a public school background. Yes, his father was an ambassador. But, you know, people have to remember he dropped out and, and had travelled um, and had been a folk singer called Woody in Wales and this sort of thing. It wasn't a case of, you know, he suddenly reinvented himself as man of the people. He, he had rejected his background very wholeheartedly. So Strummer walked in and he knew instantly it was going to work. He just said it was, the chemistry was there. He just said it was, it was absolutely fantastic. It was just like straight away, it all fitted, you know, perfect. We used to argue and it was because uh, I think I remember Joe saying he felt I was a bit conceited and I had all my life all under control. Uh, there was no sense in which I was suffering. They liked the idea of we should suffer. And I, I didn't like suffering. I just liked to have everything organised. You know, so. The first few times we took to the stage was kind of odd because 
the people in the audience didn't know what the hell was happening, they didn't know what to make of it at all. Uh, probably if you went out and started singing Chinese, you get a similar reaction of like, what the hell is this? Um, so that was the, f the beginning. Uh, then we started doing some gigs with the Pistols. And the fortunate thing for us was the Pistols had already got some sort of a following of people that like dressing in crazy clothes and mad haircuts and, and liked that kind of music. So we had a, a kind of instant audience. Very, very useful when you're setting up. <laughs> to see the, the famous infamous Sex Pistols and this band clashed were on much lower down the bill and they just came on with those um, skinny horrible threads and paint spattered all over them and uh, singing words that sounded uh, vaguely to do with these present day existence at that time as it was sort of airy fairy western crap that was going about at the time. I would say that the, the process from starting off rehearsing to getting a live set together to doing the gigs to doing the album, um, it may have seemed to happen very, very quickly and easily, but behind it was an awful lot of very hard work. We used to work ourselves very hard. We, had a, we actually made a choice to say we're going to work really hard to be the best we can be. And so that meant working very long hours, rehearsing again and again, and challenging each other on every, every issue you can think of. So it was very hard work. It was very intense and there was no let up. There's no room in your life for anything else while you're doing it. Yeah, tell me about White Riot. What's it about? Not in your gate. Oh, you know that riot they had? Well, we was down there, me and him, and uh, we got searched by policemen looking for bricks, like, and then uh, later on we got searched by Rasta looking for pound notes in our pocket, so... All we had was bricks and bottles. <laughs> but still... But one of the lines in it is everybody does what they're told to. Yeah, it's true. Clash was special because of the combination of them, like Jagger and Richards. You had those people in that band that come together and it collides and it becomes this thing which is bigger than anybody in the band. They just had the vibe of a real, they were the real deal. Mick and Joe used to conceive, be like giving birth to something like a song and they'd bring it along and then we'd rip it to shreds and develop it. And it, quite often it ended up quite differently by then, but. Uh, there was no, uh, no one's pride was spared. If something wasn't right, they'd, we'd be brutally honest and it'd be thrown out. Mick had that musicality. He knew how to arrange songs. He had a very musical brain. He, in the studio, he would always come up with ideas and you think, that won't work, and it would work. So he had that vision, or a musical vision of what things could be like. And Joe, um, Joe was just a great front man, a great spokesperson, a great charismatic leader really so that's that was his role so it all worked very well i think generally the what they wrote about was what they saw around them especially on the first album a lot of those lyrics come from incidents that that would happen in that you know in their day-to-day -day life and things they would they'd be witness to and that 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 maintained itself all the way through right through the whole sequence of albums. Well, they'd been down to the, uh, the Notting Hill Carnival and the, in uh, 76, in, in August 76, and there'd been, been the riots there. It was, they were inspired by the fact that the, the, the black guys are fighting back, you know, against the cops. Cops are pushing around and they make a stand. And at the time, there, was, there didn't seem to be a lot of that going on with, 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 with white people who just sat there taking all, all the shit. And I think that's what the song was trying to say. It's often said that the pistols made you want to smash your head against the wall. But the clash would give you a reason. And um, I think that was kind of obvious because everyone was kind of angry and mad, but Strum would be like, well, okay, we're mad, but what are you going to do about it? They were the ones that I guess gave it its kind of political depth. The clash kind of took the ball that the pistols gave them and ran with it. I guess my white mates were coming up with their own soundtrack, something that represented the way they felt. I mean, I had mine, I had reggae music. Um, but every generation needs its own soundtrack. There was a lot of confusion in the early days about what punk stood for. I mean, punk had lots of kind of right-wing notions or, or right-wing imagery. And there was this, and this kind of sort of very hard, anarchic, quite extreme ideology that, that formed in the middle. And when they released White Riot, 
I mean, people got the wrong end of the stick. What Strummer saw in young Jamaican men was the fact that they were prepared to take the fight to the institutions they despised. And what Strummer was demanding was that white people should take a lesson from their black brothers and actually get up and do something about Britain in the 1970s, which was frankly, even as a very young teenager, was a god-awful place to live. When I first heard White Riot, I'm walking along the street singing, singing this song, all my mates were laughing at me, my black mates. They're like, why are you singing that song, Rasta? They didn't understand what Joe was saying in that song was that the white people, especially the young people, needed to do, have a right of their own, not against black people, but against the system. Nothing had ever sounded like that when I heard White Riot. I mean, it sounded like it being played at, I don't know, a thousand miles an hour. You couldn't understand anything at all, except whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't know what the hell they were singing about. And then the DJ comes on and goes, that's White Riot by The Clash.